welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show but not just any episode it's fundraisers friday and we have the amazing tony bell on mr nonprofit consultancy welcome back my friend oh thank you so much julia happy friday and and happy labor day weekend so uh, i'm sure lots of folks uh getting ready to just recharge for a few days and celebrate yeah. all the great work that they do. <laughs> I love that you said that because this is a time when um, it kind of like the hammer drops and all of a sudden, okay, it's fall and we've got things cooking. And I think this is a good time to have this conversation today about how to prepare for your annual review. Because frankly, as we start you know, cranking through this next Q4, we're not going to have a lot of time to step back and maybe do some of these things as well as we should. So having this conversation now so that we can really be more focused on how this process works, I think is a, is a really smart thing. So before we dig into that, I definitely want to make sure that we're also smart about thanking our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, your part-time controller, Fundraisers Friday, where we are today, and 180 Management Group. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out. Mr. Tony Bell, Mr. Nonprofit Consultancies, one of our amazing co-hosts. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and um, I get Tony all to myself today as we really dig down deep into this conversation that Tony, I think it creates a lot of stress for people. Oh, the topic around annual performance reviews and, and, mm -hmm. and such. Yes, I, I think so too. And, and so you, you set us up perfectly around, you know, the importance of just thinking about it and, and preparing for, for that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I was reflecting Julia on, on our Fridays, and I always think of this time as like an early happy hour, <laughs> like the time with you and, and these topics are like an, an early happy hour. So, uh, so mm -hmm. I always I always look forward to it. But uh, but yeah, I love people. I love celebrating the work of mm -hmm. of folks, and so this is a, a really uh, a really important topic for me, and something that I'm really super passionate about. Well, you know, I know that you over the trajectory of your career, you've given you you've been on the receiving side but you've also been on the giving side and so i love that you come to this with understanding both sides of the desk and i think it's it's a really an important thing to to kind of frame out because not only are um professional fundraisers held to these these standards of just did you get the check or not but i think what you're going to share with us today is how we can really express and educate even our teams as to what is involved. Mm -hmm. It's not just one number on a spreadsheet that it, it it's multidimensional. And so um, I want to start off and ask you this. I mentioned this in the green room and you're like, well, if you don't have this, then you don't have a review and it's review goals and objectives. And what are the, the performance metrics? And you could say the key performance metrics or all of them, but talk to us about this because this is kind of the foundation of it all, right? Yeah, without a doubt. And 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 like you said, when we were chatting about this in the green room, my response was if you don't have clear goals and objectives, you can't have a robust or meaningful conversation around any type of, of annual performance review. Uh, so it really all starts there. And and then I even reflected back on a few shows ago where we talked about the average tenure for a fundraising professional within their organization. And, and I, I am going to say that when you have a process in place where you recognize and reward individuals for their performance or even have candid conversations around where they need to improve, you are more likely to retain that talent uh, in the organization. Uh, but again, we, you need to start with clear goals and expectations uh, before you can have a meaningful conversation or even meaningful process around any type of annual performance review. Yeah, and I've got to say, I kind of feel like, although this is foundational and, and you know, you could say this is a no brainer, 
I got to ask the question. I feel like a lot of organizations, they don't really even have this to that, to the, to the extent that they have a meaningful relationship with their staff member, staff and team, as well as a path for, for grading everybody. Yeah. And I think that's true. Yeah, I think it is true. And, and, and I think both of us try to be very mindful in these conversations week after week that our audience represents organizations of all sizes and resources. Yeah. Uh, so for some organizations, uh, I would say, yes, there is an expectation that you would have this in place. For other organizations, it, it is a matter of bandwidth and, and resources. Uh, but what I will say is that, again, when you invest in these kind of foundational best practices for running any business, whether it's nonprofit or for profit, you will see a return on that effort, a return on that investment of time and making sure that these processes are in place. But even the larger organizations, Julia, that typically tend to have these processes in place, they're only as good as the folks that facilitate the process and only as good as the quality of the communication around the process and what employees can expect um, when they're preparing themselves for their annual appraisal. So that's a, a good comment, but it's a little scary because I feel like it if it doesn't exist within the organization, it's putting the onus back on the staff member to push or direct or guide some of these things. And, you know, there are a lot of organizations in the nonprofit sector that they don't have their own HR department. They're lucky if they even have like an outside contractor. So how do you do this if you don't even have these performance metrics? Do you, is it wise to like come ahead with them yourself? and say, this is what we, what I want to be looking at? I mean, how does that work? Yeah, no, I, I think absolutely. And, and, okay. and part of the value of, of professional development within this space is empowering individuals, right, in the work that they do. And a lot of that empowerment also means advocacy for you and, and what you're doing and, and often for the organizations that, that you're supporting. So advocate for the process. It doesn't have to be complex. So that's the thing. Okay. Uh, it's really an annual uh, performance review. It's a conversation. Uh, there is a document where, you know, so that there's a paper trail, pardon me, and you're tracking kind of the mm -hmm. conversation through this formal document, but mm -hmm. it's a conversation. So it doesn't have to be complex. Uh, mm -hmm. So Yes, if, if, it, if it doesn't exist in your small or medium-sized organization, uh, I would encourage you to advocate for the process to exist. And that means showing up with examples of performance reviews, examples of timelines, mm -hmm. uh, not just showing up and saying, this is what I want, but showing up and saying, this is what I want. Here's the value of that. And here are ways that we can do it. I love that. I think that's brilliant. And I also think that raises the bar and the conversation about best practices. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on around the sector and how do we, we elevate ourselves? Um, because I, I agree with you about this bottom line, the issue of retention mm -hmm. is such a frightening thing. If, if, if we really can, embrace how much we're losing and how we're wanting, letting our, our team members walk out the door. Um, man, this is just like one of those really, really important things. A part and parcel to that, you talk about documenting your achievements and impact. Um, this is kind of a fascinating thing because I always feel like in the past, it's been like you show up to the conference room or the supervisor's office close the door and then you just sit there and you wait for them to say something or prevent present stuff. And I think this goes back to what you just said seconds ago, advocate for yourself. Talk to us about this and what that kind of will look like. Yeah. It, it, it's funny because when you mentioned that I, I, I went back to, you know, my own experience in times where you did, you went, you sat in like a boardroom 
and there yes. were just the two of you, and yes. you, and you were handed copies of the performance review, and uh, and how I got even more nervous if there was a box of tissues on the table, right? So, so all those things come into play when you walk into a performance review in that, yeah. in that kind of scenario. But in today's yeah. environment, they're happening, you know, via Zoom, you know, where where one person is totally on the other side of the country uh, right. and are, are performing, you know, are, are presenting this this performance uh, evaluation. So documenting the work that you do throughout the year is really important. And a lot of the reviews that that I have participated in, even going way back to my days at American Express, which was really my first encounter in this process where performance of reviews started with you, where you do a self-evaluation of the work that you've done over the year. You self-evaluate your ratings, and then that is submitted to your immediate supervisor. That's pretty much standard best practice these days. So making sure that you are documenting for yourself your accomplishments throughout the year or those areas where there might have needed to be some additional training uh, or professional development for you to meet a certain expectation, documenting those as well. And whatever that looks like for you, whether that's an electronic folder uh, or whether that's a you know, just a folder where you're writing down notes and dropping it in, you know, an actual manila folder. They still sell those at Office Depot. Um, <laughs> you know, you might be you might be using that process, but document your achievements throughout the year. Because we've mm -hmm. said many times that the, that big gift, it took work. And there were many successes along the way to get you there. So you want to make sure you're documenting all the successes along the way. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's also important when we talk about the self-evaluation. Many times, you know, did you meet goal? Okay, I was at a, you know, I was at 100% of goal or 125% of goal, mm -hmm. and this is why. So make sure you take the time to explain in your review how you got there, or how, or or why you didn't get there, and how you think things yeah. that might have been different could have put you there. You know, I think that's a fascinating approach, Tony, because otherwise it's punitive, punitive if you didn't make the goal, right? And then it, it, the other, on the other side of it, if you made the goal or you exceeded the goal, it's just like, wow, okay, you were lucky versus no, I worked hard. I was strategic. This is how others on the team can learn. This is how our industry can learn. This is what I'm learning from our industry. It just seems to me like it's a lot more um, intelligent to be thinking this way for the for the health of, of the organization, right? Not just that individual person's review. Oh, yeah. Well, I think you said something really important there. And when you said that folks may respond to your success as just being lucky. Yeah. And that can yeah. happen sometimes depending on, you know, who's facilitating the annual review. If you're an executive director, it may be the board chair that is yeah. facilitating this annual review. Um, and without a clear understanding of the work involved to get mm -hmm. to the ask, to get to the confirmation of the investment, uh, it can be easy for someone to say, well, that large gift was a referral from a board member. Right. To really kind of devalue, lack of a better term, and that sounds dramatic, but the work that's yeah. done once the referral is made um, right. to bring that folk, that, you know, that individual on board. Well, and I think I love that you said that because I hadn't really thought of it exactly that way, but it kind of dovetails to the concept of, you know, relationship building and time spent and the journey of a donor's gift. I mean, that could have been solicited and developed brought in by the previous you know fundraiser and then carried across the finish line by the one that's being reviewed and conversely that person that does this work could you know leave or somebody else gets credited for that um for that gift mm -hmm. it's it's brutal i mean and i think that's one of the things we talked about portfolio management recently but you know um, how 
you you don't always get credit if you will or get noticed or what doc, it's not always documented your work that your gift that you brought in it gets sometimes you know assigned to somebody else yeah well i think that you know that's why conversations around retention and legacy donors uh is also important when we look at the the entire perf performance of a fundraising professional i mean it, it takes effort to retain a donor uh so regardless of whether you're kind of just absorbing that as someone that's part of your portfolio now and someone else brought them in it doesn't really matter retention is super important uh when it you know when it comes to to fundraising so we definitely you know need to celebrate and and make sure that we're valuing that as well right and tracking it for these reviews i think it's just such an interesting conversation and also before we go on to the next thing i think this speaks volumes tony about how even within our own organizations people don't know what we do they don't know what a fundraiser does i said we i am not a fundraiser i've, I've been a community fundraiser and you know but um again there's that oh they just go out to lunch and have cocktails or go to parties and squeeze rich people for money right no. i mean it's a horrible horrible attitude and mindset but it's a false narrative that i think really exists across this country i really do tony and I, I don't know if you agree or not but you know, I, I mean i think it still exists in certain markets mm -hmm. uh i think that the demographic of donors has changed yeah. uh quite a bit so that it's not that what you're explaining which which was very prevalent <laughs> you know uh, i don't think it is as much as as it was in certain markets definitely it, yeah. it, it still you know it, it still exists that way uh but but the, you know the the landscape has has changed dramatically in in terms of who's supporting organizations and and their motivations yeah well i maybe i'm revealing what it's like in my community <laughs> Okay, another part of preparing for this, you know, all important review, identify challenges and offer solutions. Wow. Okay, this is not something that I thought would be part of our conversation. Well, I, I think we're in such a great place today, uh, not only in the nonprofit sector, but I think in many sectors, when it comes to mental health, I mean, mental well-being, when it comes to professional development, uh, these are conversations that historically someone wouldn't have out of fear that they would be perceived as lacking in some way. Yeah. Uh, I can't, you know, oh, well, they need training. Well, they can't do the job. Uh, right. But I think that that has shifted in, in the healthiest of ways uh, in, in today's environment. And I think most healthy annual appraisal processes allow for this type of uh, transparency and this type of self-evaluation mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, in, in your own self-review, you can say, you know, looking towards the next fiscal year, I hope to be able to improve my skills in these four areas. And this is how I see that happening. And then identifying, you know, being part of, of this membership, right? It might require a membership. It might require a six or seven week course for a certification, mm -hmm. but really kind of identifying that and okay. how it will help you excel in the work that you do, ultimately furthering the mission of the organization. Right. I, I like that because I feel too, Tony, that so, I, I hear this so often that um, from folks that are desperate for um, education and professional development, and they feel like their organization doesn't support them or, or doesn't see that that's an investment. And I always think it's tied to the fact that we are losing our staff members too rapidly. And so that the executive team looks around and says, well, if I train you, you're just going to get a better job somewhere else, right? It's a it's a really an awful sense of of what's going on. Um, and I don't think we I don't think it's spoken. I think it's kind of an undercurrent about how professional development works. 
But I agree with you. I think that there's just so many opportunities now with the digital, you know, uh, learning environment that you can uh, get a, an amazing amount of information. And I think things are opening up. I know you just went on the board of your AFP mm -hmm. um, organization where you live in Florida, things like that. I mean, don't you feel like that is part of that ecosystem and in and, and, and elevating everybody? With, oh, without a doubt. And I, I think, you know, in particular for today's fundraisers Friday, yes. You know, you know, yeah. engaging in in organizations locally like AFP mm -hmm. uh, is a is a big part of, of professional yeah. development. So many of them have robust mentorship opportunities. So, depending on where you are in your career, you may need a mentor or you may want to be a mentor. Right. Uh, and you learn so much from being a mentor. You know, I we talk a lot about how it was, how it is, how it might be, right? So right. Uh, so being a mentor and, and connecting with uh, the next generation of, of young leaders really keeps you in tune with, with mm -hmm. that kind of vision and, and the thoughts mm -hmm. and, and priorities that are happening uh, with the folks that are ultimately going to take your mission and, and cause to the next level. And I, I love that approach uh, for a review to say, you know, that could be one of our goals and I want to be supported on that. And uh, because I think that elevates the sense of thought leadership within the organization and externally to the community, you know, well, I, to do that. I, yeah, you know, it supports the whole concept of all of us being lifelong learners. Yeah. I mean, when, whenever I've, I've had a, a review and, and there's that opportunity to talk about where can I be better I mean, there were plenty of things for me to put in there. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's always something for us to learn uh, yeah. and, and to elevate. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think that's a, that's a humble approach to, you know, kind of looking at these things. Okay, let's talk about the next thing, because this is a little bit more difficult. and We don't have a lot of time, but I want to spend the rest of our time talking about this and that's dealing with feedback and criticism because it's such a frightening thing. I think it's frightening to give criticism and give feedback. Um, and, you know, when you're receiving it, it's really hard to hear it and to process it. And, and there's like all these emotions and fear and stress. And I'm wondering if you can kind of give us some ideas of how we should be navigating this and even just even thinking about it. Yeah, well, it, it's it's true. It, it create. I think regardless of the process that's in place, as as uh, inclusive as it might be, and as transparent as it might be, there is still anxiety yeah. when it comes to having this conversation. And and you know, other than saying maybe have a chamomile tea or something before, I don't know that there's really, <laughs> I can't offer a really good solution. Uh, you know, and, and I think part of that too is just that so many of us, if not all of us, care so deeply about the work that we do in this space that we really can't show up with anything other than a little bit of anxiety when the work that we're doing to support these great causes is kind of being evaluated. But I also think that the best processes are those that when we do show up for this conversation for an annual review, there are no surprises because we've had conversations throughout the year. It's either been through monthly reporting or quarterly reporting, one-on-ones, again, whether those are weekly, monthly, or quarterly with our supervisors. By the time we get to an annual review, we should have a really good understanding of how we're performing and how our performance and contributions are being perceived um, or tracked uh, or valued, you know, by uh, by our direct supervisor. So again, feedback and criticism, we're, we're going to have anxiety over it regardless of the process. But I think the best processes are those that are in place where when we are coming together to have this conversation, there are no surprises. Mm -hmm. No one is surprised by the feedback that they're receiving on both sides. I think that when the supervisor receives the self-appraisal from, you know, from the team member, 
There shouldn't be a whole lot of surprises in that. Uh, there, there hopefully are some great reminders, right? Because they're, I'm sure they're overseeing a large team and, you know, there's a lot of relationships to manage and, you know, in terms of team members and probably their own portfolio of donors as well, right, right in many cases. Right. Uh, so the self-appraisal is a great way to remind your immediate supervisor of the work that you've done, but they shouldn't be too surprised by a lot of what they see in there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so interesting. This conversation has not gone the way I thought it would uh, with you. And what I'm hearing as we wrap up that it really, when we talk about preparing for this, it really is on us, right? It's, it's, we're going to be a lot more comfortable, successful, have less, fewer surprises and be more strategic if we are spending the time up front literally preparing the, these documents and making it um, gosh, easier for that process to occur. Well, well, you know, and again, some, you know, don't, don't be afraid to get your own flowers, right? So get your own flowers and get yourself ready for that. Uh, yeah. And a lot of performance appraisal processes are electronic and allow you, the one that I most recently went through, allowed me to even upload documents. So oh, wow. posts from social media or letters from clients or letters from team members or, you know, so it allowed me to kind of upload supporting documentation above and beyond my content to support how I viewed uh, and perceived my performance and value to the organization. So, uh, so again, documenting that stuff throughout the year, screenshotting, you know, wh whatever that is that you're most comfortable with, uh, but just implementing that process. So throughout the year, you can just, you know, drop information in there. So it's easier for you come the end of the year to gather all of that. Well, and I think too, sometimes we forget what the journey has been. And we just tend to focus on that last phone call at the end of the day that maybe didn't go the way we wanted. Right. It's like that negative feedback just tends to like loop, loop, loop in our head. And then before we know it, we're not feeling at all successful. And that's not the way to go into um, a review unless you're going to spend more time saying this is where I'm struggling, but this is how I can get help. This is where I can get support. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that, you know, identifying the challenges, but offering solutions and saying mm -hmm. this is what we need to activate. I think is a brilliant way to lead anyway, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's going to protect you from the end. Um, well, once again, you've just given me so much to think about, and I'm I'm so amazed at what you're able to bring to the table, um, and grateful that you're on our team and that you take this time to invest with fundraisers um, on Fundraisers Friday on the nonprofit show. It's really amazing. I hope for those of you going into this process that you're able to really think about this and, and maybe be more successful in, in your own developing your own strategy and, and really navigating this. Our executive producer, Kevin Pace, reminded me yesterday that um, if you are not sure, like maybe you missed part of this or you want to share it, depending on the platform that um, you come in on and join us on, you know, these shows get re-looped. So if you stay on whatever platform, if you're in uh, LinkedIn or X or maybe even YouTube, um, this show will re-loop and then you can see what you might have missed in the very beginning. So um, I just wanted to bring that up as well as our archive. You know, we hope that you share these episodes and uh, spread the word because they really are great, great assets and resources to learn about. Another great asset is really our presenting sponsorship board. Um, they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, <laughs> Your Part-Time Controller, Fundraisers Friday, our new show, and 180 Management Group. It's really an exciting group of folks that support us and are with us. And we're going to be debuting some new sponsors um, in the next couple of months as well. So you'll get to learn more about them as well. Hey, my friend, I hope you really get to enjoy this holiday. You have labored through the summer, getting ready for the fall. We all could use just a few hours of, of a respite 
And so I hope you get to achieve that. You as well. Thank you again for the opportunity. I, I look forward to our happy hour every Friday. Well, I know you're in the East, so you're winding down. I'm in the West, so I'm just starting up. So I'm like, oh man, I wish I could wind down. You know what? Five o'clock somewhere. So. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to put that on my calendar so that I know it's five o'clock in the East. And so it's quitting time. Oh, my gosh. Well, hey, everybody, we like to end every episode of the nonprofit show with this mantra. It's pretty simple. It goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone.